That's a lot of pressure, Travis. Yeah, we do have similar jobs, however. Um, I've had the privilege of overseeing worship and chapel at Baylor for 17 years, and uh, uh, I love it there, uh, but in 2001 to 2007, my wife was actually the director of recruitment for Truett Theological Seminary, and so she would come to Abilene fairly often, and she always spoke so highly of Hardin-Simmons. And of course, I've had friends here through the years. I know Dave Roseboom is a friend who's here. I don't know if he's here right this moment. If he's not, I will um, ridicule him at another time. Travis, I thank you very much for the kind invitation. And Kristen Scout, you're fantastic. I don't know where, there you are. Thank you for all your help in arranging this. And I also must uh, thank my friend, Dr. Miles Wernz. He is a professor at Logston here. And he's a friend of mine from seminary days, and we just really enjoyed uh, last night getting to reconnect. And this morning we ate at the Flippin' Egg, and it was flippin' awesome. (laughs) And so I feel fulfilled. Michael and Natalie, thank you for leading us in worship this morning. What a great primer to what we're going to do here. So I'm really bad about um, trying to get a great deal. Anybody like that? Uh, my, my oven just went out yesterday, and uh, on the way here, my mom happened to be visiting Waco. She lives in Mississippi, and she, she grabbed the handle to my oven, and it had already, the clock had stopped working years ago, and she had already uh, realized that the burner was burning a little too hot because the, the spring on the door wasn't working properly, and she grabbed the handle to open it, and the handle came clear off, just came off, and so I thought, well, Ugh, I gotta replace my oven. And so I began to look at Lowe's on my uh, phone, and I thought, I wonder, I don't even know how to budget for an oven. I've never purchased an oven before. And so I start to look at the various ovens, and my mind immediately went to, wait a minute, I know the assistant manager at Lowe's. I bet he can get me a deal. I'm all about the open box. I want the open box. I'm happy with the open box. I can install the oven my own self. Just save me the $75, right? So that's just kind of the way I function in life. I have three little boys. I don't have any money to spare. And so I want the deal. However, I listen to podcasts all the time. Anybody a podcast fan? Anybody listen to podcasts? I listen to a lot of podcasts. And the way I listen to them is through these little doodads right here. These, you recognize these? They're in a bundle because that's how I store them intentionally in my pocket. I do this and I put them in my pocket. And the reason that I wanted to show you this is because I did not get a deal on these particular earbuds. These are the Apple brand earbuds that are ridiculously expensive. So I go to a bookstore and I look at all the headphones and it happens every time I wanna buy headphones. I go to the bookstore and I walk in and I go to the left side of the aisle and the left side of the aisle are the bargain brand headphones. And I think, oh, you know, I could spend like even as low as $4.95 on a pair of headphones. And so sometimes I do that. And I take them out of the package and I put them on and I'm immediately disappointed. And I wish I had not done that. These, on the other hand, if I'm not mistaken, are $29.95. I feel like I'm on HSN right now or something. (laughs) These can be yours for the low, low price. But $30 is a lot of money to spend on headphones. But when I buy other headphones, I'm consistently disappointed. And do you know why I'm disappointed? I think I'm disappointed because I'm trying to get the same experience at a cheaper price. I'm trying to get the same experience I have with my Apple headphones, but I don't want to sacrifice what it takes to have that experience. I want to get that without the cost. I think we experience that a little bit in the Gospel of John, chapter 10. We know that we are the kind of people who want abundant life. Man, we want abundance. That's why we we're, do we're what we do. We want to make some money. We want to go home. And college students, I know you're probably in a position where you say, I'm getting this degree. Why are you getting the degree? Well, many college students would report, in the United States at least, that you're getting the degree so that you can accomplish something meaningful with your life, 
so that you can get a paycheck, so that you can buy a great house, so that you can have a great family, so that you can raise fantastic kids who can go to college and who can get a great job and a great paycheck and buy a great house and have a great family and they can raise their kids and they can send their kids to a great college. And you see where I'm going with that. But college students today, I've done a nationwide study in the last two to three years on 10 faith-based university campuses. And one of the things we learned, uh, our respondent rate was about 2, 000, uh, 20, sorry, 20,000 students. And we realized, it's this thriving study, and we realized that college students today want one thing more than anything else, and it's not a paycheck. They want their lives to be meaningful and purposeful. They're looking for meaning and purpose. I don't know if you resonate with that at Hardin-Simmons, but I think you probably do. Your, your rep uh, reputation precedes you. I have uh, known of Hardin-Simmons for many years and visited here from time to time, and you have a stellar reputation, and your students are phenomenal, and uh, I come in contact with many of them through my daily activities, and they, just like any other, long for meaning and purpose. We want our lives to mean something. We want them to be meaningful. In the book of John, in that chapter, we read, Caleb, thank you for reading that earlier. We read about a God who has come so that we might have life and have it to the fullest or have it more abundantly. Jesus, in that same passage, calls himself the eternal shepherd, the pointer of the way to life. You know, I'm thinking that what I'll do is I'll ask Travis next time I go to the bookstore. I'm going to say, Travis, will you come with me to the bookstore? And will you just hover over the Apple headphones and just point like this? And I'll, you don't have to say anything. And I'll just walk in. And instead of spending, wasting all this time over on the left side of the aisle, I'll just spend time standing there. And I'll just know right up front because you're pointing there. If you were to do that, maybe you would be what you're probably trying to be each and every day, which is like Jesus. Pointing to that which is ultimately fulfilling. Pointing to meaning and purpose. So in chapter 10, we hear, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I come so that you may have life. So Jesus likens himself to a gate. Now, what are we to imagine about a gate? What does that mean? Let me tell you just a little bit about what it could mean. There are sheep pens in this time, and in this case, there are several different kinds of sheep pens, but in this case, we're going to assume that this is a sheep pen that's out in a field. More than likely, this is the type of sheep pen that doesn't house one kind of sheep. It, it, it has several herds of sheep all combined into one. So I might bring my herd of sheep, you might bring your herd, and you would bring your herd, and just like we might dump all of our kids into the same hotel, we'll dump all of our sheep into the same pen, right? But, so you might wonder to yourself, well, how would you then distinguish which sheep are yours? I can't necessarily distinguish which sheep are mine. The sheep are the ones who self-select that they are mine. Because I come back after a time of rest, we've paid one shepherd to watch the door, the gate. There's one way in and one way out. And that shepherd is there. We come back to the shepherd and we say to him, it's time for my sheep. And I give them my distinct call. And my distinct call is something that only my sheep know, and only my sheep will come. And so my sheep will leave the pen with me. Does it make sense? So we have this, this group of various types of sheep, a diverse group of sheep, if you will. And they're all bumping up against one another, but they all know one thing. They know the sound of the master's voice. They know it when they hear it. And so we have these sheep in this pen, and Jesus likens himself to that gate, saying, I'm not the voice of just one of those masters. I'm the voice that all of you can recognize and understand. So gates can be used for several purposes, right? Gates can be used to keep people out. Gates can be used to keep people in. 
gates can also be used to welcome others in. So in this time period, we have shepherds who are guarding this gate. Jesus says, I am this gate. Sometimes the gate is not a physical structure at all. Sometimes the gate is the shepherd himself. So if you can imagine a, a, a field pin, so out in the field, maybe it's just made of thatch and it's in a large circle and then there's this one way in and one way out. Rather than having a gate, a shepherd might simply sleep in the gateway so that if a sheep were to try to exit, it would obviously wake the shepherd and he would be able to go and retrieve that sheep. And so if you can imagine Jesus not just saying, he's not saying I am an inanimate object. I am a rusty, squeaky gate. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying that I am that shepherd there with you, protecting this space, but also ushering you to a greater space. There were some Turkish shepherds in World War I. I was reading about this this past week. And in World War I, the Turkish shepherds would have their sheep roaming about, and people would come to try to steal their sheep, and they would take the sheep. And the problem is the people who were trying to steal the sheep couldn't herd the sheep away because all the Turkish shepherds had to do was make their distinctive call. And when they made their distinctive call, the, shepherds, the sheep would inevitably turn back and follow back to the Turkish shepherd. So it had to be a frustrating experience for the thieves, right? They're, they're trying to herd these sheep and get them away to steal them, and they're unable to because the Turkish shepherd continues to make his call. Aren't we that way? Aren't we a group of similar and then in many ways, different kinds of people bumping up against one another, waiting and listening for a call that might give us meaning and purpose. Do you ever feel that way in your class? Do you ever go to your class and you're sitting in your class and you say, I'm just looking for one thing in this class that really has meaning in my life. Faculty, don't we have that burden? Isn't it a burden placed upon us to take the curriculum, the material in our courses, and make it apply to the students' lives? We want our material to have meaning and purpose. You guys, the students, want your class to have meaning and purpose. And I have to tell you, students, we as faculty will rejoice when you show us that you have discovered that linking place where you have discovered meaning and purpose within the material. It is one of the most joyful things that can happen in a faculty member's life. I had a student just the other day come to me, and she said, you know, Ryan, I was in Southern California for spring break, and I had a layover, and I was sitting in the airport headed back to uh, Texas, and she said, I started to wonder, is this what my life is about? And I said, unpack that a little bit. Tell me a little bit about what you mean. And she said, I wonder if going back to class, she said, I have friends. I, I'm, I'm fulfilled in my relationships. But going to class, I just don't see a lot of linkage. And I'm wondering if this is what my life's supposed to be about or if I'm supposed to go back home. And so I did the, the basic questions of are you homesick? Are you feeling lonely? You know, these kind of things. And it wasn't an emotional experience for her. It was a logical, cognitive experience. Uh, she was thinking, is this the type of person I want to be coming to this class in this place with this major? And I asked her to go through a period of discernment for about two weeks. So she's in, in the midst of that right now. But I will tell you, if she comes back to me and says, you know, I've asked a lot of people, I've talked to her about discernment, and if she comes back to me and says, I think that, that I really need to go and reevaluate what I need to do, I will encourage her to do that. I don't want you to stay in your classes if you're not finding meaning and purpose. I want you to hear the call of the master. And the call of the master is a call that we all can hear if we just tune our ears to hear it. You know, there's a passage in another one of the Gospels in the book of Matthew that says that uh, Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. You know, I don't want to go in the gate by destruction. I thought we just talked about a shepherd who loves us and cares about us, and now I've just brought up another gospel passage that says, oh, you know what, though? Broad is the gate that leads to destruction. 
Well, you know, there's many different ways to build a pen. As I said earlier, there's field pens, but then there's other types of pens, like in a cave. Sometimes shepherds would come together and they would run their sheep into a cave that just had one entrance and one exit. And they would utilize that cave just like a pen. Or they would make a thatched area in their villages around their homes. If you've traveled much abroad, specifically to the central span of Africa, you will notice a lot of these practices are true today. These pens are still made in much the same way. Sometimes they'll make a mud pen that sheep can stay in. It's a logical conclusion that we might draw that it would be easier to get in and out of a wide gate than it would to get in and out of a narrow gate. So a narrow gate might seem somewhat safer. But Jesus says that the narrow gate is difficult. And it also leads to life. So this is tough. So do we choose the wide gate that's a little easier, or do we choose the narrow gate that's a little more difficult? You know, the Greek word for difficult here is thelibo, which really means to press against, to be uh, compressed, to straighten because of, of friction, of difficulty. The lexicon adds that this word can be metaphorically uh, viewed as trouble or affliction or distress, that this is the way that leads to life. You know, years ago, my mom had heart failure. And uh, she's fine today, but she lives with a defibrillator installed in her chest. And she was in a coma for several, for about a month, and she was in the hospital for several months. And she was, as I mentioned earlier, she was just at my house. And if you were to ask her today, you know, what do you think about that? Did God bring that heart failure on you? She would say, of course not. God didn't cause my heart failure. And she would say, but God sure has used it to show me life, to teach me about life. She's been through cancer twice. She's had breast cancer. She's had colon cancer. She's had heart failure. And, and I wonder sometimes, Mom, how, how are you not just really frustrated with God? And she would say, because I get to live my life in a way that is different now because of those trials, because of those circumstances. Life is different. Life is great. I can sense the marrow of life because I have seen the difficulty of life. Students come to my office all the time, and I'm sure some of you, you faculty and staff students come to yours as well, and they'll say things like, I just want to be happy. Can you just teach me how to be happy? And I answer that question the same way every time. If you want to be happy, let's start with the grief. Because you don't get to go around grief, you don't get to go over grief, you don't get to go under grief, you must go through it. And therein lies the happiness. I think that's maybe a little bit of what Jesus is talking about when he says that narrow is the way that leads to life. Maybe Jesus is making the point that the developers are lining up to build huge sheep pens. If you'll just go with me with this metaphor for one moment, maybe Jesus is making this point that the developers are all ready to make sheep pens that are extremely luxurious with all the bells and whistles, with flat screens, maybe 70 inches uh, in the sheep pens, and, and feeding troughs, and, and circulating fans on the side of the sheep pens installed, and maybe the sheep are walking on plush plush astroturf, and maybe there are little sheep manicure and pedicure stations so they can get little sheep mani petties all the time. Maybe that's just a thing that's happening. Maybe the developers are really excited about this, and maybe they think they're going to sell a lot of these sheep pens because it's so attractive. And then maybe there's this other developer who's over here, and he says, well, you know, my sheep pen... It's just kind of your, your average sheep pen, and to the naked eye, it's just... Uh, a sheep pen, just like any other. And, and yeah, the gates, I mean, the, the entrance is a little bit narrow and it's gonna be a little harder to get into, but, but if you look just below the surface to my sheep pen, I mean, I don't have the big flat screens and all that, but if you look just below the surface, what we do have is our sheep are entrenched in relationship with one another. They love one another. They love the differences about one another. Our sheep are, are breaking bread together. 
They are singing songs together. They're sharing together. And they are having, finding commonalities in amongst their difference together. Doesn't this sound a little bit like Acts? The, the origin of the church. Maybe there's that sheep pen that's over here that just chooses not to compete with the broader sheep pen. So this is the, the, the point I'm trying to make with you this morning. I'm wondering, and just a small caveat, this is not necessarily in the text. This is just my own theological pondering. I wonder if the reason the way is broad to the nicer sheep pen, I'm wondering if that is because Jesus just knows that people choose that way. Not because uh, he, know, he wants people to go that direction, but rather that he just knows that we will choose that direction so many times, that so many times we will go try to get the cheap imitation headphones. Even though we're going to be disappointed ultimately, even though we know it does not lead to life, we're gonna go opt for those. And so we need to make more space for those. Basically, I'm suggesting that maybe the great architect designed the gate to meet its capacity requirement, knowing that so many would choose their own path to life. The gate only needs to be narrow because so few choose it, the gate to life. Now, I do want to make this point. The, the gate that leads to life, this is not the word in, in the, the, the Gospels that means eternal life. This is not the word that means heaven or some kind of heaven-bound life. This is just regular old like life, life. This means abundance in the life that we live now. This is not saying that Jesus is the way to eternal life. That, that exists in the, in the Gospels, but not here. This is actually saying that Jesus is the way to abundant life here and now. Life that is full of, wait for it, meaning and purpose. Maybe Jesus is pointing to us, each one of us, and saying, you know, these are the things you should be involved in. These are the things your mind should be thinking about. Things that are pure and holy and right and true. Think on these things. In the great metaphor of the gospel, we, in many cases, are sheep, and we follow a shepherd. And I'm wondering if the good news is that the shepherd tells us there's life on the other side of difficulty. I tell students that sometimes it's, it's a good time to be nervous and to worry is when everything's going perfectly well and you've had no difficulty in your life. And sometimes I, sometimes I joke, you know, students, pause your ears for a second, the faculty and staff, sometimes I joke that uh, I have a really hard time even talking to a student if life hasn't kicked their tail yet. Because if life hasn't kicked your tail yet, if life hasn't gotten very difficult at some point, it's very hard to show a student what life is outside of that, on the other side of that. But now, students, I certainly don't mean that uh, you can't find abundance in your life. But I do mean this. When life is hard, when you feel sad, when you go to class and you wonder, why am I here? This may sound trite, but turn to that person who's showing the way. As the old song goes, turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus. Because Jesus is not leading you to some frivolous, empty, fake, uh, cheap imitation of life. Jesus is leading you to life and life more abundant. I had three little boys. I have three little boys at home. They're nine, five, and three, and they're, they're a joy. But I got to tell you, one of the reasons my three little boys are such a joy is because of the two miscarriages. They really taught me something. They taught me to value life in a different kind of way. So sometimes it's good for us to celebrate in the difficulty because narrow is the gate. And again, it's not because it's hard to find abundant life. It's because we just choose to do it the wrong way so many times. Let's choose the hard path. 
Let's choose the rocky path. Let's choose the steep path. Let's choose the path that does look more difficult. Let's choose the path that doesn't come with all the bells and whistles. The journey is not one of open prairies and easy pathways. I love driving to Abilene from Waco because it's just wide open space. And I have to tell you, one of my favorite things about that drive is that my cell phone doesn't work. And I don't mean that in a derogatory, I mean that literally. I set my phone down and it's not an issue. So you know, sometimes, I don't mean to draw such an easy correlation here, but I'm going to. Sometimes we think that things that lead to life are things like, oh, I'm connected to all of my friends and family on my phone. That's fantastic. (laughs) Good for you for being connected. But do you know what my phone does all the time? It interrupts me when I'm trying to do something. And if I'm trying to spend time with God, don't be fooled into thinking you can put your phone on silent because it will still vibrate and buzz and do all those things that phones do, and it is rude. It interrupts my time with God. It's just rude. So this is my suggestion to people. In order to realize what presence with God means, put it on airplane mode. Put your phone on airplane mode and just put it away. Then once you take it off airplane mode, all the messages will come pouring in, and you'll be able to experience those as if you just received them. And you can get the little, you know, serotonin lift in your mind or whatever it is that's happening when we keep getting all these messages. But take some time to be with God and enter the gate by the narrow way. It is not the narrow way to leave our phones on, to leave all the distractions on. It's the narrow way to say, I'm going to be still and quiet. I'm going to drive to Waco today and I'm going to turn the radio off and I'm going to put my phone down. And I'm going to choose not to listen to a podcast for a few minutes. I did that yesterday. I came in in silence. It was extremely meaningful. Because when we're quiet, maybe, just maybe we can hear that still small voice of God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this season together. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts together were pleasing to you and will remain so as we leave. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Thanks for being here this morning.